My guest today is Scott McWalter, who is a resident of Prince George, a city that many years ago, I was a salesman working for All Canada Radio and Television and had to go up there on uh, every, every three or four months to talk to the advertisers and talk to the radio and television stations. And Scott, you were born there, I understand. Absolutely. Yeah. Born in, and raised in Prince George. Spent some time living in Kitsilano on Kitts Beach, about three and a half years. But yeah, I'm a, a Northern boy. I love Prince George and a, a fierce advocate for Northern British Columbia. How, how has Prince George grown in terms of population size over the last 5, 10, 15 years? Actually, it hasn't grown significantly, Peter. It's been around 75 to 80,000 people for about the last half decade to 10 years. And that's coming off of, of the 90s, where it was in the late 60s, early 70s. So there hasn't been significant population growth. However, the population is really starting to take off right now, especially in the last year, where once the pandemic arrived on a global scale, people started to realize that a very valued commodity was having space. And that's why we see a lot of people, especially from the lower mainland and major metropolitan centers like Calgary and Alberta, starting to head north to Prince George and, and other northern BC communities. So do you do business outside of Prince George <coughs> in other communities? Yes. Yeah, so I have a lot of clients with, with my marketing company that are based in Prince George, as well as different northern communities stretching from Prince Rupert out to the, the west coast, and then up north in Fort St. John and Fort Nelson areas. But in terms of southern uh, lower mainland, uh, not so much. I primarily focus on northern British Columbia. One of the quotes that I really appreciate uh, what you said, you said, today's leaders in northern British Columbia have to navigate complexity, rapid change, and unpredictable markets. Explain those. So I, th I think that really stems towards the fact that in, in Prince George, we've in the past have operated on just a northern BC scale. But what we've seen with the, the evolution of digital assets, such as companies' social media channels and, and their websites and their search engine optimization is that their customers are now global, where it's not just Prince George consumers that might be demanding a product from a Prince George or Northern BC company. You're seeing a lot of companies that are based in Prince George, where their markets that they're penetrating might be Asia, might be Europe, might be South America, might be south of the 49th parallel, our friends in the USA. So you're seeing a lot of companies that are developing and really getting comfortable with doing business on an international level. Yeah. You also say that effective leadership within any organization is critical. Give me two or three or four very important leadership um, situations and then explain why they are so important. Absolutely. That's a, a, a great question, Peter. I like leaders who don't focus on being a leader. Their focus is developing their team and their staff to become leaders themselves. And a situation that comes to mind is a, a very important client of mine, which is uh, the Brink Group of Companies. And a friend of yours, their CEO and founder, John A. Brink, who was born during the, the Second World War in yeah. Northeastern Holland. He's turning 82 this year and, and still working over 70 hours a week doing business, where a leadership quality that he has is that he doesn't give up in situations where most people would. Mm. And that's something that I noticed when I started working with him about six years ago, is that he doesn't give up in most situations where people would. And so I've tried to apply that philosophy to other areas in my life, because as human beings, it's so easy to get sidetracked with failure. If you try a new endeavor, and sometimes taking action can be the hardest part to start in. But it, sometimes once you do take action, you start and things don't go according to plan, we get too easily discouraged and we may give up or try something else where the most successful people that I know and that I see today are the ones that have failed their way to success. When yeah. things didn't go right, they persevered. When they visualized one goal and it came to fruition in another way, they kept on striving. And so that's a real strong motivational thing for me is that I try my hardest not to give up when things aren't going right or when I experience failure. Because at the end of the day, failure is just a learning experience. Failure is, is something that we should embrace instead of being afraid of. Yeah. 
uh, failure to me it just says just don't do that again and, and <laughs> unless you fix up whatever whatever didn't work but I, I i agree with that i heard or i read somewhere that when john landed in prince george and i still don't know uh, we've got lunch with him next uh, friday by the way in vancouver that's right and uh, the very first day he went to work he wore his suit and tie is that true that's absolutely true. So John arrived in Prince George in July 1965. He had $25.47 in his pocket, didn't know a single soul, didn't speak the English language yet, and he ended up hitchhiking his way to Quesnel, which is about 110 kilometers south of Prince George, and he only had one set of clothing, which was a three-piece suit, and he went straight to the mill in Quesnel, wore that three-piece suit about six hours into a shift he ended up taking off the blazer so he was just down to to his shirt and dress pants and that's what he worked in for the the, the first couple of weeks at his job in Quesnel. yeah ma amazing man amazing man and he's got the more energy <clears throat> and he comes up with ideas like 10 minutes after you think he should come up with the idea now but it's it's more fulfilling when he comes up with it when, when he shares it with you 10 or 15 minutes later <laughs> Definitely. And I actually only gave you two examples to your original question, Peter. The, the third example uh, would be to implement mentorship as, as often as you can. And whether yeah. it's as a recipient receiving the, the mentorship and know when you're receiving valuable mentorship, but also being in a position to maybe provide that, that mentorship to others. And I know that in your case, in, in several of your books that you wrote, you mentioned Joe Siegel, who was a, played an instrumental role in your personal mentorship and the not just the the lunches that you guys had together but the philanthropy work you collaborated on and and just the the brainstorming the conversations that you had together you must have learned so much from from joe siegel i did we we've, we've been good friends for many many years um had i don't know how many lunches at the four seasons um he's, he's in his 90s yeah, in and, his nineties. Uh, yeah, we 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 talk at least once or twice a week. Uh, not about anything specific, but uh, he's still as sharp as a sharp as a tack. Uh, it, it's amazing. It, and he, understanding a business. He was actually responsible for the title of one of your books, correct? The the runway of life. He was. Yeah, he was. He said the, the life is a runway. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and you have to be aware of all of those three areas because it's going to end. Uh, it doesn't go on forever. Uh, so make the most of every single day, every single opportunity, try not to make too many mistakes, learn from those mistakes, apologize for those mistakes and, uh, and move on. I couldn't agree more, Peter. And, you know, I, I think about an individual who we've both had the honor of interviewing on our respective podcasts and, and that is Rick Hansen, where a lot of individuals and a lot of successful individuals love the opportunity to provide mentorship, going back to that big M word. And Rick, we just reached out to him, to his office, the Rick Hansen Foundation, asked him if he wanted to be a guest on our podcast. And immediately, and, and thanks to the fact that I, I know his, his niece, who I graduated with at UMBC, he said yes. And here's an individual that's internationally recognized for the the money he's raised and the advocacy he's provided for spinal cord research. But the fact that in his Man in Motion World Tour, he wheeled across 34 countries, raised over $26 million for spinal cord research. He was, some days he was wheeling up to eight and a half hours a day on an average of 80 kilometers each day. And here's a, a Canadian hero that we reached out to him and he was more than willing to, to do the podcast interview because he wanted to provide that inspiration to individuals across the nation. I read, uh, either he told me or I read somewhere, he has 36 honorary degrees from universities across this country, Canada, just in Canada, 36. Yeah, and absolutely well-deserved. There was a absolutely. period during the 90s and the 2000s where he was, it seemed he was getting an honorary doctorate of laws degree uh, every, every year, every convocation in May. And he actually received an honorary doctorate of laws degree from the University of Northern British Columbia in 2008, which is the same year I, I graduated from my, my undergraduate. And so he gave a speech at convocation and, and you could hear a pin drop with the 1500 people that were on campus that day for his speech because it was so moving. Is that a rare, rare occasion for, some, for them to uh, give an honorary doctorate degree to somebody who, who's not from Prince George? So 
I, I believe that they like to focus on Northern BC residents and the last two honorary doctorate of laws degree have been uh, Northern BC residents, uh, but they also gave one to Dr. Bonnie Henry and they've also given, they like to, to focus on a lot of indigenous leaders, not just from Northern British Columbia, but across the, the nation. And, and so that's where a lot of the, the focus has been on for the university. That's good for them. So tell me, what, what's the scope of your agency? Well, we really like to focus a lot of our marketing efforts in the digital world, although we, we collaborate with a lot of, of traditional mediums of media, which are still incredibly strong in Northern British Columbia and, and small communities in general, where our local print, our local radio stations, our local television stations, they are still incredibly strong. And so what I recommend when people are partnering with our, our marketing agency is when you're looking at your integrated marketing mix, make sure that you include both a portion of digital and traditional communications that you want to leverage for your company. And it depends on the industry on, on how much is weighted in, in each area. But I always recommend if you're doing business in Northern British Columbia and looking for a great marketing strategy to definitely incorporate traditional and digital mediums in your mix. This is a crazy question, but I haven't been up there for many years. Is CKPG radio and television still operating, still going with those call letters? CKPG is absolutely still a force in this community. They're doing fantastic work. And I've, one of my best friend's dads, uh, Gord Layton, was the general manager in the, the 90s. So when I was growing up as a kid, we always got to kind of be see behind the scenes of the television broadcasts and all the, the radio and news personalities. and. And it was it was really neat, and I think that's really what what inspired me to get into marketing in a, a later age was not just to see the impact, the great impact that these individuals and companies could have in the community, but also that they had fun doing it. Marketing is fun, and you you should have fun with your your advertising, and it shouldn't be so serious. You should find a way to maybe incorporate some humor, or at least enjoy the process of of collaborating with individuals on these marketing campaigns seeing them get implemented, and then looking at the analytics and insights afterwards to see how great they performed. I agree with you. I, I think most businesses could incorporate a lot more fun in their day-to-day, -day. Uh, not frivolous fun, but a lot more fun, and that gives energy and gets people excited about what they're doing. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, let's be honest, Peter. We are not on this planet for a long time. I, I mean, I think Jordan Peterson, the, the famous Canadian psychologist, he just did a podcast where he literally said that life is like the illumination of a firefly in a summer night. It's like that and is gone. And so yeah. and it goes towards your, your runway of life talk with Joe Siegel, where you talk about uh, that you might only have 20 Christmases or 15 birthdays or 10 Easter's left. You just never know. So sometimes you just, I mean, it, you want to you be professional, you want to do a great job, but you can't take life too seriously because none of us are getting out alive. No, if, if I'm lucky to live to 100, that means I've got um, left, less than 20 Christmas dinners left. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Because you're in your, your late 70s and born in England. And, and what age did you come over to Canada? At? Uh, 12. So you're, you're 12. And yeah, we came, we came right to New Westminster. And I went to Vincent Massey Junior High School and Lester Pearson High School. And uh, in those days, New Westminster was a much bigger and robust community. It's, it's a great community now, but it, it, it was kind of the center outside of Vancouver in, in yeah. those days. So yourself being born during the second world war 1942 yeah I, I feel like you must just have such a heightened level of of gratitude towards everyday living just because you know the war days even though you're an infant i mean you were still alive during that time and, and you know how hard times were back then and i mean we you talk to a lot of people where, where times are challenging and, and difficult now, but I do feel when I talk to individuals from that generation, they just have such a, a high level of gratitude to, for everything that they have in present day life. Yeah, in, England, I, I love England. Uh, very happy to have been born there. Uh, I go back there. I try and go back at least once a year, certainly once every two years for sure, visit some friends and uh, do some shopping, go to a play, just 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 take take in the architecture and uh, 
see how, it, believe it or not, how London has still grown and developing, but how it has also changed. So um, to me, it's, it's kind of the, still the center of the, uh, we, we live just a little outside of London, but I, I view London as kind of the center of the world, which is perhaps unreasonable, but nevertheless, that's how I feel about it. Well, you also have to think how much spending the first 11, 12 years of your life in England has influenced you to who you are today. And I mean, we talk about your book, Under the Influence, and what I love, the message in this book is how you talk about how everyone is the sum of all of the life experiences and all of the associations and all of the influences that have affected them throughout the years. And, and that's where people should be spending time on, on finding positive influences in their life and whether it's individuals or, or whether it's current work projects or whether it's hobbies. And you should always be looking for those positive influences to incorporate into your life because overall that's going to make you who you are and who you are going forward. I don't think I hear enough people uh, speak in positive terms about the runway of life. Um, as, as Joe calls it, the runway of life is only so long. Let's say it's 100. Uh, well, Joe's in his 90s. Um, but he says, I, I'm, I'm not going anywhere, Peter. Uh, but at some point, at some point in time, we're all going to go somewhere. Uh, so make the most of every day, upset as few people as you possibly can, give back to your community, your province, your country, uh, this world as best you can. And it's, it's amazing what, what you're able to accomplish beyond what you really believed you could have done five, 10 years ago. Absolutely. And, and everything that you just said there, Peter, I, I feel like that personifies Joe Siegel perfectly, but it, it's also the epitome of the philosophy that your friend Jimmy Pattison has always had, where one thing that I find synonymous with Jimmy Pattison is passion. And passion can be a loaded word because you hear like, find your passion, go after your passion. That's That could be a tall order for a lot of people because a lot of people, I'd say 95% of people are not going to find their passion in life. The, the one thing that they were born that they know they should do. We find things that we're interested in that we really enjoy, but in terms of somebody that finds their passion at a very young age, and that's what they do for their entire life, it's very, very rare. So when I talk about passion, I always recommend that people, when they're thinking about passion, that whatever they do, do it with passion. Don't be on a constant search to find your passion because you might not find the, find the, the thing that you're just going to be absolutely passionate about, about for the rest of your life. But whatever you do, do it with passion, whether it's a sport, whether it's a work project, whether it's you know, going out with friends and, and doing a hike. Like, do everything with passion, even if it's something you don't enjoy. Do it with passion anyways. Jimmy told me in the last uh, year that the very first car dealership he got was a GM car dealership. And um, he didn't pay for it. They gave it to him. But it was losing money. The dealership was losing money. It was his dealership, but it was losing money. So he took over a dealership that was GM dealership that was losing money, but he had to turn it around first before they would give him more, more business, more, more dealerships. And look where he is today. I mean, he's doing right 13, 14 uh, billion dollars a year. And uh, um, he's still on time for his meetings and uh, punctual and polite and courteous and uh, well-mannered. And uh, he, the, one of the keys of him, he does absolutely everything he says he's going to do. Yeah, and that's the definition he, of integrity. Yeah, whatever he says he's going to do, he does. He might not do it today if he can't do it today, but he'll get it done tomorrow or the next day without question, without question. Well, if so, you don't, uh, I mean, if, if you say you're going to do something and you don't, that can become habitual. And, sure. then, and then what happens after that is you stop trusting yourself. When you yeah. get into the habit of saying you're going to do things and, and there's no follow-up, you stop trusting yourself, which could be the worst predicament or situation a person could, could find themselves in. So, and also sometimes it takes that, that extra motivation to get you going as well. And, and actually, that's where I first met you, Peter. It was in 2010 in Vancouver when I was living in, in Kitts Beach. And I, I went to a talk of yours at, at UBC, and it was with my, my friend Murph, and, and we bought a copy of, of your book. And it's uh, this one, I still have it right here. And I, I have it signed, The Power of a Dream, 
and it's it's signed as well and oh wow and, yeah and i was talking to you and i i i asked you for advice i said you know i, I was working in finance at the time and banking extremely boring and i i asked you about my my mba i said said i'm i'm looking to do my mba i've been researching universities ac across the, the country i see there's a couple in toronto and there's one in my hometown of prince george umbc uh, but I don't know if now is the right time. You know, maybe I'll do it next year or, or maybe I'll do it in 2012, which would have been two years from that time. And, and you told me to go after it. You said, you, you said you referenced your wife, Kay, and you told me about her experience and her story with her MBA program, which was a two-year program. And you said you could start now and be finished in two years, or you could be having the same conversation in two years saying, should I start this? And so I actually owe you for the motivation to, to get started, taking action right away and completing my MBA. Oh, you're too kind. Well, Kay was, uh, because, because she got her uh, master's degree, she became a marriage counselor for 12 years. Uh, and, and that's what she was training herself to do. And she absolutely loved it. And, uh, but she wouldn't have done, she wouldn't have gone into that profession had she, had she not uh, got her degree. For yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, shout out to Kay. And I know that she's uh, a very special woman who you love dearly. And I think you mentioned 53 years of marriage now. So 53. congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. I'm crazy about it. So what is, what is your biggest challenge today? The biggest, biggest challenge today is growth. Absolutely. And a lot of new entrepreneurs, I, I'm a year and a half into my marketing agency, but a lot of new entrepreneurs, they don't know how to manage their growth strategy. And, and too often growth might be synonymous with something that you absolutely have to do. Uh, but it should be managed very, very carefully because if you grow too fast, that can cripple your business. All of a sudden you spread yourself too thin and clients who are used to getting a certain high level of attention, it, that might be reduced by 25%. These things get noticed because when you go above and beyond for your clients, you set that benchmark and you can't regress from that. So if you're going to grow, create a strategy that you surround yourself with the right people, that you surround yourself with the right leadership and you actually have a plan of where you want to be in the future. Don't don't just try to accept growth and hope it works out well. Plan and strategize for that growth and come up with a plan. How how are you going to handle an an extra 20 clients? You know, how are you going to handle an extra 5 clients? If, you know, know where you are today, plan for you want to be in the future and know that that growth strategy has to be managed very very carefully. So what is it what what is the scope? What is the broad scope of your agency? Well, in digital communications and, and marketing, we do a lot of social, social media work. So we do a lot of, of sponsored and targeted campaigns on, on the main social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram. We have a ton of companies that love YouTube, Google AdWords advertising, especially for the search engine optimization you get from those. But we get a lot of companies that are really interested in TikTok right now, including uh, education, a lot of post-secondary schools that are trying to reach that younger demographic, that younger age demographic. And a lot of these individuals in the age range of of 18 to 24, they might not even be on Facebook anymore. They might not even be on Instagram anymore. They're going straight to TikTok and that's their social media platform of choice. So knowing what social media channels are relevant for what demographics and also knowing that there's gonna be successors to these popular social media channels right now. Just because Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, TikTok are popular now, doesn't mean that's the case in six months from now or a year from now or two years from now because Consumer habits and consumer behaviors are changing at a rapid pace. It's never been seen before. So you really have to stay on top of these trends. So would you say those are some of your biggest challenges as well? I would actually say that's probably one of our biggest sustainable competitive advantages is the fact that we are having this on our radar constantly, that we're constantly researching and modeling and, and making sure that the platforms that we're using are appropriate for the consumers that we're matching them up with. Uh, I, th I think that you, you're on top of the ball of podcasting. I, I think there's a, th a large growth opportunity for podcasting where they go. All right, right now, I, th I think we're going to look back at podcasts in five years from now and, and be thankful that we got our podcasts off the ground and watch the evolution of them and as they grow. Mm. I agree. I agree. So what one thing would you like to share with this audience that you may not have seen yet? But they might want to do business with you in your in the Prince George area. What one thing could you tell them? Because we're, we're kind of across, we're certainly across Canada, but we're certainly across Western Canada in a big way. 
yeah, I, I know you're prevalent across the country, especially in, in Western Canada. What I'd really like to, to say, Peter, is, is not necessarily recommend that, that companies get in touch with me or, or, or look to use my agency per se, but I think that individuals and companies should take a hard look at Prince George and other Northern communities for doing business. And whatever line, industry or line of business that you might be in, the North is growing. And the North, I mean, I think it's over 80% of our pro provincial uh, gross domestic product comes from the North. And we have a lot of, of young professionals that are going to school at UMBC and the College of New Caledonia, but also in trades that are getting senior management positions in their, their mid or late 20s. Right out of, of university, they're getting these amazing opportunities that I found when I w was living in the Lower Mainland that those weren't available right away that you'd have to put in the time to get those. So if any companies or individuals are looking to, to really get ahead and, and to maybe take a risk and, and try Northern BC living, there is so much opportunity in the North and it's just waiting to be leveraged. Well, this audience is across Western Canada for sure, but where in their closing comments, where would they reach you? How, how do they reach you? Yeah, the, the best form of contact is via my website and, and that art we can be reached at mcwaltermedia.ca. So that's mcwaltermedia.ca. And if anybody's interested in, in just talking marketing, I love to chat, talk marketing, uh, talk industry, and, and I'd love to connect. Okay. And if there's anything I can do for you, uh, I, I, I keep thinking one day I got I to gotta get up there and speak up there again. I, I used to speak there a few times a year, but I haven't done that for many years. So if that happens, I'm, I'll, I'll touch base with you before I get there. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what, Peter, if, if you make plans to, to come up to Prince George, let's make it huge. Let's rent out one of the hotel conference centers. Let's rally the community. Let's get some, some other speakers that are on stage before you and let's get a charity involved so we can raise some money for them too. And at the end of the day, let's have fun with it. Let's, okay. uh, let's bring in our passion and have fun with it. I'll get Cherry on that right after this conversation. Fantastic. This has been very interesting. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, you're a very bright young man. And I wish you all the, the success in the world. It's a lot of hard work for a long time. But you know what? If you're having fun, it doesn't feel like work. And you, you're doing something special that's needed in that community. So well done. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Scott.